Our goal is to support sustainable economic growth in Gaza, and it's a little known fact that the Palestinian Authority is the principal financial supporter of Gaza. The people in Gaza are dependent upon the Palestinian Authority, which is another reason why the increase in economic activity in the West Bank is not only good for those who live in the West Bank, but those who live in Gaza as well. To help spur private investment through the Palestinian uh, territories, this summer the United States helped sponsor the Palestine Investment Conference in Bethlehem, which generated $655 million in pledges targeted at high growth sectors. So Palestinians should take pride in all that has been accomplished in a short period of time. And the World Bank recently reported that if the Palestinian Authority maintains its momentum in building institutions and delivering public services, it is, and I quote, well positioned for the establishment of a state at any point in the near future. Last month, I visited Ramallah and saw this progress firsthand. After we crossed uh, the Betunya checkpoint, well-equipped Palestinian security officers lined the road. They are more professional and capable than ever, thanks to strong leadership and increased training that the United States has helped to assist. We, thank you. <laughs> We drove into the city and I could see new apartment buildings and office towers rising from the hills. The streets pulsed with commerce and activity. But as I looked at the faces of the men and women who came out of their shops and homes to watch us go by, it was impossible to forget the painful history of a people who have never had a state of their own. For most Americans, For most Americans, it is hard, if not impossible, to imagine living behind checkpoints and roadblocks without the comforts of peace or the confidence of self-determination. Economic and institutional progress are definitely important, indeed necessary, but not sufficient. The legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people will never be satisfied until there is a two-state solution a two-stage solution ensuring dignity, justice, and security for all. Now, I know that there are those who think that if they wait, scheme, or fight long enough, they can avoid compromising or negotiating. But I am here to say that that is not the case. That will only guarantee more suffering, more sorrow, and more victims. Violence in all forms is a dead end that perpetuates the conflict and empowers those on both sides who would exploit cynicism and discord. That is no path at all. Nor is it viable to build the institutions of a future state without the negotiations that will ultimately create it. Now, we have no illusions about the difficulty of resolving the final status issues of borders and security, settlements and refugees of Jerusalem and water. And it's no secret that we are in a difficult period. When President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu came to Washington last month, to relaunch direct negotiations, we knew there would be setbacks and struggles. Our position on settlements is well known and has not changed. And our determination to encourage the parties to continue talking has not wavered. I cannot stand here tonight and tell you there is some magic formula that I have discovered that will break through the current impasse. But I can tell you we are working every day, sometimes every hour, to create the conditions for negotiations to continue and succeed. We are urging both sides to avoid any actions 
that would undermine trust or prejudice the outcomes of the talks. Senator Mitchell will soon return to the region for further consultations. We have not given up, and neither have President Abbas or Prime Minister Netanyahu. We remain convinced that if they persevere with negotiations, the parties can agree on an outcome that ends the conflict, reconciles the Palestinian goal of an independent and viable state based on the 1967 lines with agreed swaps, and Israel's goal of a Jewish state with secure and recognized borders that reflect subsequent developments and meet Israel's security requirements. This will resolve all the core issues and, as President Abbas said the other day, end all historical claims. Now, in any tough negotiation, it is natural to focus on what we are being asked to give up. But it is important to keep in mind what you, what Palestinians and Israelis stand to gain. In this case, the benefits are undeniable. You know, you can't put a price or a value on dignity, but it's a very precious commodity. Justice and security for both Israeli and Palestinian children alike. They deserve to grow up free from fear and to live up to their own God-given potential. As long as this conflict continues, that will never be possible. Bold leaders are called to rise above obstacles and seize opportunities to make history and put their people on a path to a better future. Since the beginning of September, I have spent hours and hours talking with the President and the Prime Minister. I have listened to them and I have watched them engage with each other. They are serious about this effort. They are grappling with the core issues. I am convinced they want to be the leaders who finally end this conflict. But they cannot do that without support from their people. And not only their people living in the region, but their people living here and elsewhere around the world. All of us who are committed to peace and the right of both peoples to live in security and dignity have a responsibility to do what we can to help them succeed. You who are Palestinian Americans are here tonight because you understand that. And this organization has stood for that over so many years. The Arab states and the people of the region have a strong interest in resolving this conflict, and they too have an important role to play. I deeply appreciate the support that Arab leaders and nations have provided for direct talks and for the vision embodied in the Arab Peace Initiative. I hope they will all continue to support the Palestinians in their diplomatic efforts and the state-building work on the ground. The Palestinian Authority needs a larger, steadier, and more predictable source of financial support. The United States is proud to be the Palestinian Authority's largest donor. The European Union has stepped up as well. But the broader international community, including many Arab states, can and should provide more financial support. It takes far more than commitments and plans to support making the state of Palestine a reality. And in fact, as the Palestinian economy has increased, the need for future assistance has decreased, but there is still a gap, and that gap has to be filled. So as we press ahead with diplomacy, I hope that Arab states will also consider how to begin implementing the Arab Peace Initiative in concrete terms to turn that proposal into a reality as well.
And finally, those states in the region that are supplying weapons to groups such as Hezbollah and Hamas must stop. They should publicly reject <laughs> the divisive voices who seek to discourage peace. And I will repeat today what I've said many times before, Gilad Shalit must be released immediately and returned to his family. People on all sides of this conflict must choose to move beyond a history they cannot change to embrace a future they can shape together. The poet Naomi Shihab Naj, whom we are honoring tonight, understands this. She writes powerfully about the unfulfilled aspirations of the Palestinian people. What flag can we wave, she asks. But she also says, I'm not interested in who suffered the most. I'm interested in people getting over it. And that, That is the biggest obstacle of them all. I know people cannot forget. I know most people cannot forgive. But I do know also that the future holds the possibility of progress, if not in our lifetimes, then certainly in our children's. I spend much of my time now as Secretary of State traveling around the world, speaking with people who find it so hard to move beyond the past. It is not just in the Middle East that that remains a challenge. And yet when I speak with young people, they are focused on tomorrow and they deserve that tomorrow, a tomorrow filled with opportunities for them to make their own destinies and to help their own people realize that collective aspiration. The American Task Force for Palestine has been a consistent advocate for this path, and I thank you for your efforts. But I know that some in this room, like many across the region and the world, have your doubts about the prospects for peace. So let me appeal to you tonight. Please don't give up in the face of difficulty. Through your charitable work, you already make important contributions to the progress that is happening on the ground that is literally changing Palestinian lives. You have funded thousands of cataracts